it's such a cool thing. Like Sundays, you come expecting kind of like one thing, and then whatever God's going to do, God does. He kind of just meets you there. So today I was in the fountain. Um, you today are sitting in the seat that you're sitting in. Uh, your generosity is also like absolutely critical, critical in some of the most basic things, like helping get the air conditioner back online. So uh, thank you. Uh, no, I, I cannot stress this enough. Like people just come to church and they just think like the church is going to be and do its own thing. It does not happen without your involvement, your participation, your part played in the most elemental ways. So um, it was your generosity that helped fund the repair of the AC. It's set to 60 degrees right now. Like I'm trying to freeze ice. I want to like keep cubes Christy's wearing a jacket, so I appreciate you're back in good form. Um, so uh, here's where we're going to be today. We're closing down this study on uh, 1 Peter and uh, introductions. For introductions' sake, my name is Mingo, one of the pastors here, and I've been uh, lucky enough to take us through this uh, study on 1 Peter. And if you've been with us for any number of weeks, the the theme of the whole book that Peter, a friend of Jesus who uh, walked with him, saw the miracles, was uh, kind of a hot mess even in his like early 20s. Uh, he thought he was helping the ministry of Jesus, but he was in his own unique humanity, just kind of being a mess in the mix. And Jesus is like, come on, you're gonna, I know you're developing, let's keep this thing going. Peter is going to become this, you know, my, he's going to become like this mighty witness for believers that come after the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, Peter will be a witness to all new believers and folks gathering together in these first century churches. And he's going to write a letter in his 70s, rough, roughly his 70s, uh, to people who are under much oppression. It's economic oppression, religious oppression. It's um, the oppression from the local government uh, to press against people who are putting their faith and their relied um, uh, belief into something other than Caesar. And they're experiencing much oppression because of it. And Peter will write, everything that you're going through in this moment, everything that you're struggling under, all the, the challenges and the pain and the angst, it is worth it in this short-term uh, moment because what you're going to experience by inheritance in eternity is so much greater. It's worth the struggle. It's worth the fight. As we get to chapter 5, uh, that has been his focal point uh, for four chapters. And in chapter 5, he's going to do this great thing where he's going to pivot his attention to the local church itself. And he's going to speak to people who participate in gathering, which means that there's plenty of crossover for you and I as we extract from the scriptures today. Um, and then he's going to leave us with this really fantastic illustration that I hope today encourages you to see the light at the end of the tunnel, to see the goodness of God like we sang in worship. God pursuant of you, despite whatever it is that you have found yourself managing or mitigating in this season. So I'm, I'm really thankful that you're here. Thank you for choosing. I know we have AC and it's our bill, not yours. I get it. Uh, but like you are here because God's going to reveal something that you need to have in your heart and in your mind going into the week to come. Uh, yesterday I was at the beach with my family, like all 5 million other San Diegans, and um, we were at 15th Street, and uh, uniquely, Bravery, my 12-year-old, our oldest, he is like at that perfect cusp where he is no longer like bouncing around in the white water trying to surf. He's like got enough swimming chops that he can make it all the way out to the lineup. Uh, and so he's like now with the big boys, right? And he's kind of in uh, the lineup and I'm having to teach him and show him all of the like kind of like surfer law. You know, there's like rules to the game. You know, I'm like, hey, if there's somebody already on the wave, don't be that kid that's just like mine. And then like that guy's going to come fight me, not you, right? Um, there's uh, like good waves to go for. There's waves to not go for. It's like this really intense in the midst of the moment, like mentoring that's happened between me and my 12-year-old. And I realized um, as he was paddling, he's not like developed that rhythm yet for the biggest waves that he's going for. He can't quite under his own strength get into them or he's way, he's in the wrong spot. And so he just gets pummeled. 
And so I was like, hey, Bravery, here's what we're going to do. You're going to paddle ahead of me. You're going to be about seven or ten feet ahead of me. I'm going to tell you start paddling. You're going to have a bunch of guys that are going to feel really overwhelmingly like going for the same wave. I'm going to get in all of their way, and you're going to go. And so I start paddling for this wave, and I'm just like, go, go, go. And I, like, you know, little Billy sponsored by Rip Curls, like right here to my left. And then, like, this dad on a longboard, he's like been there for 100 years on my life, right? And Bravery's paddling with all of his might, and I know that he still doesn't have what it takes to, like, get the inertia to kind of get into the wave. And as I bump into him, I give him, like, that perfect, like, dad soul, just like, you go, <laughs> you. And, like, Billy on this side's like, what are you doing, man? You're messing up my wave. And this dad's just like, I've been there, bro. Um, and I push, and I give Bravery all the extra inertia he needs to get into something that's like, he desires it, but he doesn't have the strength yet to get to it. And I just was thinking, man, this is Peter's chapter five. He's giving every one of his readers that last, like, I'm going to get you into this, and you're going you're gonna to freak out when you finally see it for what it's worth. And that's exactly where Bravery was. He came up over the other side. Bravery's been begging me. He's like, Dad, how do I go left? How do I turn on my surfboard? Because he's just been bouncing around in the white water. Like, that's not the fullness of the experience of surfing. The fullness is like when you can have open water ahead of you, and you're just moving down like this, like this moving motion of water. It's just like it, it's addicting. And Bravery, for the first time, is like, jamming down the wave as I see like his little head and he's just like, I did it. And I'm thinking in my head like, man, Peter is looking for this last push. He's going to close his letter so that you would see your position in Christ. You would see the power that God is hoping that you'd grab a hold of. And he's going to give his readers one last kind of inertive push that's going to get them to where he prays they see where he's seen for his whole life. And so as he gets into this, he is going to aim his conversation at the folks who are regularly gathering in church, the people that are committed to one another, the people that are flawed, and there's a lot of friction, and they're bumping into each other's like, you know, versions of church that they want, and he's going to speak over them some things that I think we can absolutely have and hold on to uh, as we kind of craft the culture of what it means to be together in church ourselves. And I want to read it to you, and then I want to extract some of the things from it. It starts off this way, if you've got your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 5. It says, And now a word to you who are elders in the church. I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ, and I too will share in his glory when he is revealed to the whole world. As a fellow elder, I want to appeal to you. Care for the flock that God has entrusted you to. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you'll get out of it, but because you're eager to serve it. Um, or sorry, uh, not for what you'll get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Verse three, don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. Verse four, and when the great shepherd appears, you'll receive a crown of never ending glory and honor. Peter's going to aim at um, the topic of Christian leadership and church leadership. And what I want to like kind of uh, petition for you and from you is this idea that he's not speaking to like rostered salary church peoples. Uh, he's going to actually speak to uh, them in like a particular language. He's going to say uh, to the elders in the church, I too am an elder. And he's going to qualify himself. He say, I was actually a witness to the actual life of the person of Jesus. So he's actually speaking to a, a class of people within the local body of believers. I would call them seasoned church folk. They're the people that have been around the block. They're the people that have been to a few services. They're the people who, when the fill in the blanks come on, you probably could fill the blank in before I get there. Uh, they're the people who uh, have uh, seen a few things in their time. They've aged like fine wine. They're the people who probably have regular seats somewhere in their service. And then when somebody else comes to your seat, you're like, oh, Lord, meet me with mercy. There's somebody in my seat. <laughs> if you sit inside of any one of those like kind of qualifications, you would be considered somebody who's seasoned an elder per se amongst uh, the people that you're doing church with. And he has a few encouraging words for you, if that's you. If you're 
new to church, if you're checking it out, if you're kicking the tires, if you're wondering if this is the kind of congregation that maybe you want to go along with, you're kind of exempted from this statement, but I want you to see it and I want you to hear it as a way by which we hold ourselves accountable to how church is done here. And it really, it doesn't start with you. You know who it starts with at the end of the day? Jesus is the right answer, yes. But in, in people form, culture starts, frankly, with me. How I posture, how I position, how I expect to show up, how I lead, how I serve, that's the shepherding example of how all of us hopefully experience. If you've ever heard us talk about church here uniquely at Torrey Pines, I always try to frame it in this uh, image of a family. I want this church to feel not just like a family, I want it to have the DNA of my family. I want it to feel like uh, people who are on the outsides and outskirts can feel like they're insiders. I want people in every generation to feel like they have a valuable, important part to play. I want people who are skeptics to feel like they've got a good space amongst peers that they're in good company with. I want seasoned believers and baby believers to all feel like this is the place that God has brought them for this space. And Peter's going to speak very specifically to ways by which we create that culture. And I want you to hear it because it is the marker, it's the accountable rhythm of how we should experience church here today. It starts off by him saying this, I want you to lead willingly, not grudgingly. Okay, if you're filling in the blanks or if you're taking notes about like what a good church ought to feel like, Peter's going to lay it out for us. Lead willingly, not grudgingly. What this means is don't ever feel like when somebody presses you to play a part in church, uh, that it's a healthy environment. If we ever talk about like the need for people to join and jump into ministries, it's because we want you to get something. We don't want to get something out of you. Now, this is tricky with churches because sometimes they'll be like, not enough volunteers in like, let's say the nursery, or we don't have every, like enough people to um, fill out, like let's say the band. Like if you notice, like the keyboards, we've been prayerfully going like, Who can play keys? What we don't do is go like, hey, if you don't play keys, God's going to hold a blessing from you. Because that's really toxic. But there are some people that will try to draw out of you grudgingly to do and play your part, and it's really not healthy. That's why my prayer is like, hey, if you want to experience more, if you want to experience more than what God has for you in this season, take a step of faith and see what happens. You don't have to sign a contract. I'm not like going to impound your car, right, if you don't serve. But I do want you to see that we have to be willing to step into those places. And like I always say, churches like Costco, I want you to try it and sample it, love it, and buy it in bulk on your own. He says, if you're going to serve, if you're going to be a part of this church, if you're going to be a seasoned leader in the seats amongst your peers, don't be passive and don't be forced, but lead willingly. Do it because you love it, because you want to see others experience the freedom and the kind of joy that you've experienced personally as God has led you into deeper rhythms with him. Don't do it grudgingly. Don't be like, ah, oh, there's nobody at the coffee cart. I guess I have to jump in there. Oh, do you want cream? Right? Like, don't do that. Don't ser- I'd rather you not serve. But when you step in willfully, God meets you in this way, does this thing that draws out of you, what he's installed in you by gifting and by talent, and it, it ministers to the church. That's an opportunity that Peter puts out there. Then he also says, lead because you're eager to serve, not for what you're going to get out of it. It's really important to realize, like, God wants you to normalize the posture of service. He actually wants that for you in your entire life. It's not just while you're at church. He wants you to see where you work as um, a person placed there, even if you're the CEO or even if you're the owner, if you're a high-ranking manager or you've had a ton of seniority where you're at, he's placed you there so you can serve because that's countercultural to the rhythms of humanity. When you serve in the places he puts you, He is going to work supernaturally through that posture in a way that would not be possible if you were just out there lording over people, asking and expecting them to serve you. 
You turn culture on its head when you approach it in a posture of service. He says, when you do it, don't do it because you're going to expect something. None of this like um, quid pro quo, like, hey, I'm going to hook you up. Just make sure I get a couple extra vacation days. Cool? Cool. Uh, He's saying, do it because you have been served supernaturally by God. That should be your motivation for the posture of service, that you'd be eager because you realize, man, God did so much for me, I'm happy to serve. However, it can start in church, but it actually applies through and to your whole life, your marriage, your families, your friends, your workplace, where you play, where you work, where you live. The third one, he says, lead by your own good example. He's talking to everybody who is seasoned in the church rhythms. Lead by your own good example. Don't lord it over people. Uh, this is the one that's the most applicable to me, I think, in this season. I'll give you an example. Um, when I do what I do here at the church, I'm oftentimes trying to kind of fill the gaps where I, if I see any gaps. So, like, if there's not enough greeters at the front door, I'll stand and sit at the greeters. When I get here in the morning, if there's, like, cobwebs on the chairs, usually I'm, like, out there kind of, like, eating up the cobwebs, just trying to make sure that the campus is ready for you, for you when you get here. And uh, over the last couple of weeks in preparation for church on Wednesday, I've been spending some, like, uh, focused time with Zane and Maya, preparing them to teach uh, alongside of me for church on Wednesday. Um, And when I was uh, in one of our times together, I had this great conversation with Maya who was like, hey, um, it's actually really encouraging when you find yourself in a spot where you're worshiping because that helps frame what worship looks like. It's leading by example. And we engaged in this conversation where I said, actually, I mourn, if I could be super transparent just with everybody in church, I actually mourn the times when I'm in church, but I can't arrive here or here because I'm thinking about all the other things that um, aren't yet done or could be done differently. And I referenced a time when I was in college and I felt like I used to just sit closest to the biggest speaker in the darkness and I just sing my brains out and nobody could hear me because it was so loud. And I said, I, like, I mourn that season. I believe the Lord is going to bring that season back. I just don't feel like I'm in it now. And she, like, just in total humility was like, I just want to encourage you to keep chasing that. Lead by a great example, Maya, who leads us in worship every Sunday, drawing and leading by example that way. And it's been, it's changed my heart in the last month, just carving out time and plopping myself in this corner and just being like, Lord, you get all of my attention in this moment. And you'd think that a pastor would be better at that. But you remember that before I'm a pastor, I'm a dad and I'm a husband and I'm a friend and I'm a follower of Jesus. And sometimes I don't connect the dots until somebody with a humble posture comes and goes, hey, Jesus, he misses you being with him. So I'm not forcing you, but I am saying like, it's a good thing when it happens. I feel like that's how the Lord has been leading me and he's taken other people and their good example and they've They've invited me to center him more. That's what we try to do every single Sunday is draw your attention back to Jesus. That's the most fulfilling thing you will ever experience in your life. We're lucky that he is the focal point and we have time to center on him. Lead by your own good example. Don't lord it over people. And then finally, lead with eternal or lead for eternal recognition, not short-lived rewards. That kind of makes sense to me in itself. He continues though, and he's gonna give like this... um, Word to newer or new-ish people, younger or youngish people in the congregation. And he's going to say this, in the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders and all of you dress yourselves in humility. And I put this in brackets in my Bible. Feel free if you want to do this yourself. As you relate to one another. As you relate to one another. I paused it right there because that is the assumption for Peter is that there is this interconnectedness of generations. There is an overlappingness of um, backgrounds and ethnicities and faith journeys that you're all doing this together like a great shuffled deck. And he says, uh, as all of you are doing this together, 
all incorporated, dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. The invitation, the thing that you can control, the thing that Peter is giving you the most encouragement for is that you would grab a hold of and you would choose humility. That the posture would be something that you welcome into your life. Because from that embracing of humility, you will have a vantage point, you have a posture to see the most important thing about God, which is God's grace. You can see God-sized grace when you embrace human-sized humility. You follow me here? And he's going to say, as you relate to one another, his assumption is that you're not doing this by yourself. That's the reason why we keep pumping and promoting things like Rooted and groups, young adults, why church on Wednesday is coming back with a vengeance. It's the reason why Des, every October, will pull together this event called Daddy Daughter Date Night because we're trying to create rhythms by which you can dress yourself in humility as you gather together. Remember, this church full of wildly busted people, including me but we get an opportunity to experience what it looks like to be dressed in that posture of humility if and when we commit to coming together. If we never do that, if we do this life isolated or on our own, solo journey, I walk in, I walk out, I don't know anybody, I never connect again, you miss the greatest power and you miss the greatest gift that is God's grace for you. It is revealed in the community aspect that Peter's pointing to. You have it, but you don't sense it until you're with another human in the rhythms of doing this everyday life. So he says, and all of you, dress yourself in humility as you relate to one another, comma, for God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That word opposes the proud, um, the word oppose there. It literally means wars against. Anybody interested in like having that uh, phrase meet you? God wars against those who are proud. Anybody like desire God warring against you? No, not me either. But it's crazy because culture would tell you the better thing to put on is pride so that you don't look like you can't handle the things you're going through. Put on pride. Put on uh, self-assuredness. Put on a face. Put on a strong face. Peter's going to invite you to do the exact opposite. He's going to say, if you can transparently live dismantled and not put together, you will embrace this posture of humility, and what it will earn you is God's grace. It's a gift that you get when you embrace your busted human self. And the world would tell you, you don't receive or get much if you're busted or disassembled. It's like, oh, you're not ready for that. God goes, if you could just be honest with me and tell me that it's not together, I'm going to unpack a truckload of grace for you. But if you're pretending to be put together and pretending to be proud and pretending to not need anything, I will war against you. I don't need that in my life. I got enough problems called my children for God to be warring against me. I want to put on humility, but it's hard. I wrote in my notes, um, the one thing I can control gets me access to the many things that I cannot control. So this is what I mean. Humility, when Peter says, humble yourself, that is a statement that he's assuming you can choose for yourself. He's saying you can choose humility when you desire to be proud or prideful or pretend as if you've got it together in a way that maybe you don't, if you can find space for transparency and honesty and humility, when you get your hands around that, it will give you access to the things that you cannot control. And let me define what those things that you cannot control are. They come in the next verse. It says, Humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. Give honor all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. He cares about you. So here's what I hear him saying. 
There's a rhythm. It's opposing to one another. God wars against the prideful. God wants to unpack God-sized grace for those who choose to embrace humility. When I choose the posture of humility, it will allow me to see with much greater clarity three things about God without a shadow of a doubt. The first is God's power, God's mighty power. Other translations say, humble yourself so that you would be um, within God's mighty hand. So it reveals his power. Uh, It talks about uh, seeing God's power at the right time. So that speaks to God's timing. It says that he will lift you up in honor and he will, he's inviting you to give all your worries in exchange for understanding the depth of his care for you. So you have access to God's power, access to God's timing, and access to understanding God's care for you if you would embrace humility. And yet everything in our culture and everything in your humanity flawed will say, don't do it. If you could just stand and be a a little stronger for yourself. And God's like, it's a lie. It gives you nothing. Humility lets you have clarity on God's power, clarity on God's timing, clarity on God's care for you. Now, it's really interesting because Peter's going to use the illustration. He's going to use the language. He's going to say, cast your worries onto God. It's like, it's a first century um, uh, illustration to fishing. And when we fish today, nowadays, it's like, you know, one pole, and then you, you reel it in, right? It's a version of that. But first century fishing is a net and a team, and together they're casting with strength for a broad cast of the net. He's saying there's some work that goes into the cast, but what you get in exchange for it, he says, You can cast your cares, your anxieties out there, and the Lord will exchange what you cast for peace and more. Now, there's something really interesting, because our culture has taken the concept of anxiety, and they've studied it really well, right? There's clinical anxiety. There's anxiety that requires medical attention, and if that's you, you're in good company. Don't stop going that direction for self-care. But that word anxiety, when Peter says, cast it onto the Lord, that word in the Greek actually means fragmented thoughts. It means having fragmented concepts. That's what he's saying. If you can't have a complete thought about something that's been plaguing you, if there's a relationship that feels fractured in essence, he goes, I want you to cast that out. I know Jesus. I saw him. He did it for me when I cast it out. And he's saying, I want you to cast it also. You ever hear churches that like, they'll say in good, um, like in a, in a good thought, they'll say, hey, if you have things that you're coming to church with today, leave them at the door and we'll get to business in here. Like we want you to, to leave your junk and the drama out because there's no room for it here. Peter's saying literally the exact opposite. He's like, bring your, tr- bring your junk, bring your trauma, bring your drama, bring your family issues, bring your personal narrative that you cannot get above, bring the things that make you cry at night, bring the things that you stress over, bring them because God wants them. He's big enough for them. Cast away. It's big. It's really big. He says the the outcome is that you're going to understand a depth by which how much God cares for you. If you hold them, you never get a chance to experience the fullness of God's care for you. The invitation is right there. He's going to continue. And he's going to, Peter's going to essentially say like, hey, everybody, y'all get a chance to choose humility. Are Are we clear on that? Everybody should lead and exist and live in humility. But he's going to finish with this illustration, he's going to say, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Verse 9, stand firm against him. Be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering as you are. That illustration 
I just, it caught my attention. I couldn't get off of it. I was into it like three weeks ago, trying to figure out like, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for me? What is Peter trying to get at? And then I went from studying the Bible and I like jumped over to like National Geographic. I was like, it's time to become like a animal expert. And I went into like lion study. Uh, and so I want to know everything about a lion, right? Because my assumptions about a lion were not accurate of what like Peter at least is alluding to. He says the enemy prowls around He's prowling and he's roaring, looking for somebody to devour. You know what a lion does when it hunts? Do you want to know? At least chat GPT telling me what a lion does. when it, I wasn't out there like, oh, the lion's on the Sahara, right? That wasn't me. Chat GPT, what does a lion do when it's hunting for its prey? When a, hyena, when a lion is hunting for its prey, it stalks, it targets, it positions, it pounces, and it does it all without roaring. Interesting. So Peter's telling me the enemy is out there roaming around, roaring, 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 looking to devour you. But you know what he's not actually trying to do? He cannot hunt you. He cannot beat you if Jesus is in you. Do you want to know what a lion roars for? It's very interesting. A lion roars for three particular reasons, says chat GPT. It says that it roars because it's threatened that somebody is coming on to what its perceived territory is. Oh. <laughs> when you understand more of who Christ is in you, the enemy is threatened. Because what you lost in territory, you start getting back when you understand. That is your inheritance. That is your place to claim. That is your relationship to put back in Jesus' name. Right? The enemy roars because he doesn't like that you have a confidence in you that is not human. It's supernatural. It's Jesus. And it beats him every time. The, the enemy starts roaring in here, starts chirping at you in ways that you don't like because he does not like that you are turning the tables on his territory. You want to know else why lions roar? They roar because they do not want to have physical confrontation. They don't want to get into a physical confrontation. Enemy doesn't want to see Jesus in you come alive. You know who you are in Jesus' name, in Jesus' family. He doesn't want that. Because the power that is in you is greater than anything that is out there, including him. Some of us go walking through this life like, man, if Jesus and the enemy were going to get into a battle, I might, I might be the sacrificial lamb in the middle of it. And I don't know if I want that. And God's like, Peter especially, he's like, I've seen it all. I've been the worst version of a human, and God has delivered on his promises through me. The enemy roars because he does not want to get into a confrontation with you. He roars. He gets in your head. He chirps loud because he doesn't want you claiming the promises or the personhood or the identity that God has given you as a gracious gift. Lastly, and it matters, lions roar because... They fear losing what they've already trapped or what they've already gotten their hands on. You ever see like the, the National Geographic footage? Like they got like some ripped apart like uh, zebra and they're just like all in it and the hyenas are all around, you know, and then like they start roaring because they don't want to lose what they've already gotten their hands on. It might be that you are such a prayerful one step away from taking back what the Lord always had for you because you're identifying the strength that God has given you, that the enemy is roaring louder now than he ever has before. Peter is finishing this five-chapter book by going, don't give the devil more credit in your suffering than he deserves. Who is in you is way beyond your comprehension by strength and grace. He finishes, and I'll just read this. It says, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation, all the power to him forever. Those promises you cannot skip over. If you're writing and marking in your Bible, these are the things to mark on. They are the promises that Peter points out in Jesus. He will restore. That word restore, it means to mend and to repair. 
He will support. It means to make stable and place firmly upon. He says he will strengthen you and he will place you on a firm foundation. You know what that firm foundation is? It's not the dream of the job that you wish you could get. It's not the number that you think would be secure for you to have in your bank account. It's not the relationship that you desire. The firm foundation is Jesus himself. And when you choose humility and you come out and you go, I don't have it all together, God goes, that's the kind of posture I need you in to place you on the most firm foundation. His name is Jesus. So the question is, at the end of the day, maybe we can wrap our hearts around this idea that we're being invited to stand firm and receive God's grace. Maybe. If we can walk out with anything in our hands, that we could stand firm, that we can receive God's grace. Peter won't let you walk out without knowing that you cannot do it by yourself. It's impossible. The, the lion will get its lunch if it can separate out from any pack one. You will become lunch. So be with the community. Dive in. When you feel weak, gather. We have this text thread, me and a few very good friends. And it's so significant, even though it's seemingly insignificant. Anything that comes our way, good, bad, or indifferent, and plenty of memes to follow, it is through this text thread with me and the closest guys in my life. It is how we stand firm when we're in the firefight together. If you don't have it, draw it up. Ask God, bring me the people. Show me in the church where this becomes how I experience you to the fullest. That's why we exist. We're going to close and we're going to sing and we're going to praise God for everything that he's given us in the last five chapters. And then my prayer for you is that you would walk out of here stronger, more certain, stable, restored, established, because you surrender and humble yourself. Can I pray for you? Jesus, we do not deserve the kind of grace that you came to deliver. And Lord, I want to hold and I want to grab and I want to own the posture that Peter has and he calls people to that we would not cower in fear of the enemy, Lord, but we would know without a shadow of a doubt that your spirit in us is victorious, that the enemy prowls and the enemy roars, but he is afraid of what he is losing as we get clarity on you, in you. Lord, would you not just be central today, but would you walk with us Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday when we worship together, Thursday when we find ourselves in groups, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday again. Lord, thank you for your word. Would you meet us? Would you receive our worship, Lord, as we call on you for who you are? Thank you for being our cornerstone. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.